We get to work in two very, very exciting areas at Google. Uh, I'm engineering vice president responsible for our developer offerings. Yeah. Uh, so Google gets several billion API calls a day. Developers calling into things like YouTube or uh, calling into uh, Gmail or even calling into our search and embedding that on their particular websites. We also have people who build on top of things like App Engine. And so all of the things that we do at Google to make the web better is part of our developer efforts. And then the other uh, group that I manage is uh, I'm responsible for all of the mobile applications. So if you've got a BlackBerry or uh, an iPhone or a Windows mobile device, you've probably used Google applications like Google Search or YouTube or Mail or Calendar or News or Photos, and, and the list is endless. And my job is to ensure that we're delivering the best mobile applications that we can. Yeah, I, I wrote a, uh, an op-ed for the New York Times, uh, I don't know, it must be a couple of years ago now. Uh, it was about the spectrum issues mainly, but in that there was one line, and it was, it was, I thought it was the most important line in the piece, and then they cut it. And that line was, uh, mobile is Google's most important strategic initiative. Uh, uh, can you reflect on that a little bit? Well, I mean, I, whether I'm right or not, uh, uh, I, I'm, probably so little, I'm probably a little biased, <laughs> because I have a deep passion for mobile. Yeah. I think that the entire world is moving to mobile, that mobile is the most personal of all personal computers. Um, and if you look at the growth rates of what's happening in mobile, we sold, what, 1.4 billion phones last year, yeah. a couple of hundred million internet-connected phones. That's more, you know, in this year, 2009, we'll sell more internet-connected phones as an industry than the entire notebook market. And so mobile phones are uh, increasing in their importance. It has a dramatic impact on the future of Google. And so I, I share your view. Uh, about well, I, I was referring really specifically to... Um, you know, the question of the open internet versus the walled gardens. Because, of course, you know, there is a battle. Mobile has historically not been an internet-like environment. And, uh, and, you know, and, and the carriers want to control it and keep it that way. And yet, you know, for Google and other web applications to flourish, we actually need it. We need the phone ecosystem to work like the internet uh, yeah. rather than the way the phone ecosystem I, I think you're work. absolutely right. I mean, if you think back, just as recently as a few years ago, if you wanted to get an application on your phone, let's say Google, yeah. you had to go through the OEM, maybe the carrier locked down your phone so you couldn't get to it, maybe uh, it was so complicated that you were unable to figure it out. All those barriers have started to fall. And to a large extent, it's been because of leadership by people like Apple. Yeah. They've really made it incredibly simple to install applications. Uh, that have made the web browser, the real internet, come to the mobile phone. Right. And uh, I think the world has dramatically changed recently. So you told me a story the first time we met about why you left Microsoft. And it had a little bit to do with this sort of future of mobile. Maybe you could share that with sure. your audience. Sure. You're talking about Tiger. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about Tiger. So obviously the reasons for switching companies, it, it, is, it, it tends to have lots of reasons. But, but what, there was a poignant moment in my life when I knew that I had to come to Google. And uh, I was out having lunch. I have, I have some small children. I have one small child. At the time, she was four. Her name is Samantha. We call her Tiger. And we were out having lunch uh, with another couple who had children. And as any of you who are parents know, uh, you typically isolate the children on one side of the table so the adults can have a conversation. And that's what we did. We were talking. And my friend asked me a question, and I didn't know the answer. So I said, Mike. You know, I, I don't know. And just at that moment, my four-year-old little girl, Tiger, uh, from the other end of the table where all the children were, spoke up and said, Daddy, where's your phone? And all of us turned and looked because she didn't know how to dial a phone. She didn't even know her own phone number. And my wife, you know, asked her, you know, Samantha, what do you need a phone for? And I told her, I accidentally left my phone in the car. And she said, Daddy, where's your phone? And then it hit us. All of us adults at the table, it dawned on us what was going on. She overheard me tell my friend Mike, uh, I don't know, when he asked me a question. And in her brief four years of life, watching her dad, she assumed that any time you didn't know uh, an answer to a question, why well, you brought out your phone and you Googled the answer. That's what her dad did. And so for her, the phone was the ultimate answering machine. Not, not the answering machine of our generation, but that if, if knowledge was available, you should be able to get to it from a phone. And at that moment, I realized that I had spent most of my adult life working to put a personal computer on every desktop in every home at Microsoft. And it occurred to me that there was a fundamental shift going on, and that through mobile and Google, we were going to make the world's information accessible and useful to everybody. 
Now, there's something really interesting there about the, not only about how we learn from the next generation, but also about how phone to you meant Google. Uh, and it says something about the phone is no longer just a device, it's a cloud-connected device. Absolutely. And in my, my keynote uh, on Wednesday, I talked about Google Mobile App. Uh, and, yeah, thank you. And, yeah, and, and I talked about this idea of the sensor-based platform connecting to cloud applications. Now, I know you've seen the, my riff on that because it's basically the result of conversations that you know, we've had. Uh, but can you kind of reflect on that in your own mind? How does the phone and the cloud work together? And, and you know, why does Daddy, where's your phone suggest you know, the cloud? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So first of all, I think we have to recognize that when we build software for phones, that this is not the same model as we did on the PC. The mobile phone has some unique attributes, and we've got to take advantage of that. So for example, you know, this device has eyes, it's got a camera, it's got ears, it's got a microphone, it's got a skin, you can touch it, and it knows your location. And so software has to really take advantage of those attributes. And what we did with Google Mobile App, uh, this is the app you can download on your iPhone uh, or your Blackberry, which we just, just released with Blackberry. Uh, we take advantage of those unique characteristics. We know your location. Uh, we take advantage of the mic. You can just say, best Italian restaurant is connected to New York. Or you can say, flowers. And we know you're in San Francisco. And we'll give you a flower shop right down, down the street. And so combining these data sources that you referenced, location, yeah. Google search, uh, and, and other things. For example, recently we've added the ability for you to add your friends as a data source. Yeah. So you can visualize your friends. Uh, and so these things so, are important. You're talking about latitude. Yeah, latitude. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, I mean, I guess the thing that's really interesting to me there, when I started talking about Web 2.0, was really, before even the name, I was talking about this idea of an internet operating system in which the subsystems weren't about controlling you know, screens and keyboards and disks and so on and, and various kinds of application resources. They were actually uh, operating system services for connecting data resources. And we are, in fact, starting to see that data operating system in the cloud emerge. Now, one of the things that I had kind of put out to the world was that, at least in my ideal world, that operating system would look like Linux. And by that I mean that it would be an operating system assembled of best of breed components from many, many different sources versus, you know, one company figures out how to be, as I used the Tolkien image, uh, you know, one ring to rule them all. And I have a bit of a question here in Google Mobile App. All of those cooperating resources are Google-controlled resources, even down to the speech recognition, you know, which is not a, a field that you were in before. Yeah. Do you guys see yourself providing all of the system services in these cloud apps, or do you see a role for, hey, we're going to actually build, for example, you know, um, when you say, I want to integrate people, would you say, oh, yeah, actually, we can use Twitter or Facebook for that and not try to build you know, our own Google friend subsystem? So that's a very complicated question. Let me, yeah. let me break it up into two parts and answer it. Your first part about the previous world that we used to live in with one you know, ring to rule them all, the world where you'd go to a big show like this and somebody would tell you what the next version of the operating system is going to have. You know, the Internet's not like that. No one controls the Internet. Uh, and that's why but do you want to try? Problems. No, I don't. <laughs> I, mean, I think anybody who tries to control the internet is going to fail. I mean, what, well, that's what's beautiful about the internet. Uh, you know, you can, like we did with Gears, you can propose some suggestions, and you can hope that Firefox and Apple and others adopt them in an open source way. And I think we've been successful with that approach. But that, by no means, is, is control. Now, there's a second question you asked, which is, what about the data sources we're using, and why do we do voice, for yeah. example? Um, I think Google will. Uh, we love partnerships, yeah. and, and we'll partner uh, in as many places as possible. There will be a few areas that we believe is core. Uh, we believe that voice, voice search, is a new form of search, uh, and that's core to our business, and we decided to build that entirely in-house. And it's one of those technologies we think that gets better with usage. Yeah. You know, we launched it on the iPhone in a quarter. We've seen up to a 15% jump in accuracy, because as more people use it, uh, we collect more data about acoustic models, more samples, and our accuracy gets better. And so we, we want to have that technology in-house, not licensed. 
Yeah. And so um, I think if we get to apply Google expertise, software expertise to that problem in a new way. But uh, you know, still there is a question of whether ultimately don't you find that to be true in so many areas? So if you look at the mapping uh, uh, subsystem, so to speak, originally uh, Navtech, Teleatlas, Digital Globe, people like that, but increasingly Google building its own data assets in yeah. you know, the location space. I mean, although I would say that Google is doing it in a way that probably no other company would do. I mean, you look at something like our location services. Yeah. If you're on an iPhone and you click My Location, those apps that ask you for your location like Loot, yeah. Uh, particularly like in Europe, if you're in this room and there's no GPS, Apple calls out, and in many cases it's the Google Cell ID which provides that answer first. Yeah. And that's an example where we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to enable hundreds of location-based apps on the iPhone or other platforms. And we could have said, no, that's our data source. We're going to keep it for our friend's app. Um, but we didn't do that. It's your idea that you've referenced. You've got to add more value to the system than you take. Right. And so we take these services, we broadly make them available, and a lot of times the innovation happens elsewhere. Well, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, you've been great at that. I mean, the original Google Maps success was because, hey, you became a platform for everybody else. That's right. Fabulous, create more value than you capture, uh, example. But at the same time, there is the question of consuming data services from other. Can you give me examples of yeah, places I mean, where you're... Today, anytime you do a Google search for uh, reviews, for example, on a Google mobile app, if you do a search for a review on a particular restaurant, when you click and you see those reviews, those are reviews that we're getting through our partnerships with other with other companies. Okay. That's a classic example where we don't have the data, yeah. um, but we're, we partner with others. Now, do you think more about, is there a generalized way to um, you know, sort of incorporate more and more services from outside to kind of set that as the tone of how we build in the future rather than say, everybody saying, we're going to race, we're going to have the best yeah. of this and we're going to own it versus, hey, you know, we're going to kind of figure out how to have standards for interoperability. So as the developer guy at Google, yeah. you know, this is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, I do believe that we're doing a decent job of providing APIs so that not only can we yeah. consume and make our sources consumable, but that we can enable innovation. I'll give you an example. I just came across an application this week that's been soft launched. It hasn't been publicized. Uh, but there's a television show called Hell's Angels. Hell's Angels? Hell's Kitchens, excuse me, not Hell's Angels, Hell's Kitchens. <laughs> I don't know how I got that one mixed up. It's a great, it's a great cooking show. Uh, what they've done is they've hired a developer called social to You who's built this app where you can kind of play this game. The, the app is built in Facebook. It's a Facebook app, but it's powered by Google App Engine. You know, the first time I saw it was yesterday. And so that's the power of having your applications and your data available yeah. so that somebody else can innovate and bring together things in a ways that you never imagined or, right. or were not even aware of. And so uh, I, think, I think that's what the internet is, the ultimate mashup. Facebook, yeah. Google App Engine, a television show, it's great. Yeah. Hey, I want to come back to this idea of developing for mobile. You know, so right now we're, we're, we've got a lot of um, different uh, sort of platforms on mobile. You know, we have iPhone, which is far and away the leader in the in the smartphone, uh, at least excitement meter at the moment. But you know, Palm's coming in with their, their Palm OS. You know, BlackBerry has got to be there. Yeah. Uh, Nokia's got to be there. Microsoft's got to be there. Um, and so developers are, you know, are, are in this position of, how do I develop? Which platform do I choose? And then, of course, there's the native web app. And when we were talking backstage, you were Tell me you wanted to show us something that yeah. you got in that direction. <laughs> I think your latest. I'm, I'm putting on my mobile hat. I, yeah. I feel a lot of pain at Google that I suspect many in your audience do, which is if you're going to build an application, what do you build it for? You, yeah. you just mentioned iPhone, Blackberry, Palm, there's Nokia, the rest of the yeah. world, there's Android, and it costs a huge amount of money to build a development team that can do all those different platforms. In fact, I would say for most startups, it's beyond their reach and they just pick one or two platforms. What's happening now is for the first time, the internet, the web, on these phones is emerging as a viable platform instead. And so I wanted to show you an app. This app is built using HTML5, the latest uh, uh, standards available within the web browser. So I'm going to show you the app uh, on the iPhone first. Okay, so can we bring that up here? Okay, so what you're looking at, let's see if I can center that. What you're looking at is Gmail, written as a web app on the iPhone. And it is incredible. It's incredibly fast. I've got some cool new features here. I can select multiple messages. You'll note the floaty bar that appeared there at the top. 
is I move down, you'll see that floating bar will move with me. It allows me to archive my messages very, very easily. You can see the starred labels. It's really a full functional app, but it's built using HTML5. So it uses things like uh, the offline cache capability. So you'll note that I'm not even connected. Look in the top left there. I'm in airplane mode. I have no internet connection. And yet, if I was to select a message, I can open up that message. It's all cached offline. Now this is a technical prototype. Stay tuned. So when, when do we get access to this? Uh, we're working on that. For special friend of Mr. Rick. But, <laughs> but I want to show you, here's the kicker. Look at this. What you're looking at now is, let's see here, I got this, there we go. You are looking at exactly the same app. There we go. Running on Android. Now, think about that for a moment. My development team was able to have one code base using the rich new features of HTML5, app cache, the database, worker pool threads, and we were able to build that for both the iPhone and Android because they have this powerful WebKit browser. Imagine if you could build apps that ran across all these phones because of the web. The web would have won as a dominant platform. And so that's what gets us really excited. I would stay tuned for this, and I think that right now it's a technical prototype, but when uh, we make it broadly available, I think people are really gonna see this as the first HTML5 mobile web app uh, from a flagship app like Gmail. Like, like Gmail was in April of 2004, it was, a, it was a great watershed moment for Ajax apps. I don't think people realize what you can do in the mobile web because of these powerful browsers. And when this thing is released, I think uh, you know, we're, we're eagerly looking forward to hearing feedback from people as to what they think. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, clearly Adobe's been trying to play in this space with, with Air. Uh, I think HTML5 and the capabilities there really are, are making just native web apps. You, you know, I think Adobe is, yeah, is got some great products. We clearly use them in places like YouTube. There's also Silverlight for Microsoft. Yeah. I am biased toward open web standards. Yeah. And so I predict you will see the video tag in HTML5 become broadly adopted. Mm -hmm. You will see open. Remember, the internet is different because it's controlled by none of us, so it belongs to all of us. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets to define what these HTML5 is. No company can dictate it. And so it's they an open try, but <laughs> yeah, You can try, and, and then in the end, if you yeah. don't reach consensus, no yeah. one adopts the standard. Yeah. And so what you're seeing is Safari, Firefox, Chrome, you're seeing these browsers implement these HTML5 standards, which is so exciting. We're so, moving the web forward. Yeah, actually, I'm kind of jumping. We were going to go to questions from uh, Google Moderator, but your mention of Chrome makes me want to jump right now to the first question sure. here, which is, when will Chrome come to the Mac? So we deeply care about the Mac. I use a Mac, and I want Chrome on the Mac. Uh, so we're working very, very hard on it, both for the Mac and for Linux. Because Chrome is an open source project, anybody here can go to devchromium.org and you can look at the builds. You can actually judge for yourself as to where we are. You can submit a patch. It's done in the open. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're making progress. You can judge you know, to the, the degree of progress we're making. But we're trying to get it out as fast as we can. But no, no ETA. No ETA. All right. So um, you know, one of the other things I want to talk about a little bit about, and this was really in the context of, of, of Google Moderator, uh, was the fact that this started out inside as one of your 20% projects. It was something that was built. Well, maybe you tell the story. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, Google has a really quirky culture. One of the things that I love about Google is uh, we have this meeting on Friday evenings called TGIF. And Larry and Sergey and Eric uh, will stand up in front of the entire company. You, know, you can come join in the room where the rest of the company conference is in. And after some prepared remarks, we always open up to question and answer. And as you can imagine, most of our employees can't physically be in the room. And so a 20% project was created to create an online, uh, like a wiki board that would allow you to uh, post a question and allow others to vote on it. So that when it came time to take questions, the top ranked questions, the questions the employees really cared about, yeah. rose to the top. That was done as a 20% project. And in time, that project added on top of Google App Engine, uh, got incredibly broad adoption even outside of, outside of Google. So you actually wanted to show us, you used this uh, for, or actually I should say you used it, but the White House used Google Moderator for Barack Obama's recent... Yeah, it, it was crazy. We get a phone call and we find out uh, that the president wants to use Moderator. Uh, the White House is going to use it. And at first we were excited, and secondly we had fear strike our heart, thinking, oh my God, you know, we're going to melt a data center. What's going to happen here? The chart we're showing you here is something we've never shown publicly. We got approval from the White House to show this. 
Um, what you're looking at is, as, as the president on whitehouse.gov issued a blog post that announced it, you can see that first spike at 100 QPS. Then you can see the next day as CNN, NPR, the New York Times encouraged people to go up and join this historic online uh, uh, town meeting with a sitting president, other people started posting questions. You can see where we added a homepage promotion on Google at 5 p.m. and we got to about 300 QPS. But you can see most Americans waited until three hours before the cutoff to, to submit questions. And look at that spike as people went up, posted 3.6 million votes, spiking almost to 700 QPS. Um, and then QPS course, question, questions it, per second. Uh, it's actually queries per no, second. Queries per it, second. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the measure we use internally to okay. measure traffic. And then you can see as the president was speaking at 1130, you can see everyone went to that board and was looking at, looking at uh, various questions. Now, if you were tasked to build something like this, nation scale, maybe world scale, we, we had no way to predict how many people were going to post questions, right? Well, you have to have infrastructure that does that. And Google App Engine, that is one of its core value propositions. We handle the scaling for you. You don't have to carry pagers. We take the Google scale, bring, allow you to run that app. And, and by the way, the 45,000 other apps on Google App Engine were totally unaffected by this much scale. And so, and it's free to get started. So speaking of our own Google App Engine, I mean, uh, not App Engine, uh, moderator questions, uh, FDTN uh, in New York City asked uh, the question of the hour, is Google buying Twitter? Because <laughs> of course, that would be very useful to have that kind of scaling uh, on Twitter. We wouldn't see the fail whale anymore, right? <laughs> I'm a big fan of, of Twitter. And yes, scaling would help there. Um, we don't, as a policy, comment on rumor or speculation. I've got nothing to say yeah, but, about but, Twitter. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's not room anymore. Uh, <laughs> you know, do we have votes? Is, well, is it Michael or is it Kara who's well, got to start? I'm, right? I'm friends with Michael and Kara, and I'm enjoying their conversation, but have no comment. All right, okay. Uh, you, you know, I had to ask. Um, so, um, in terms of other questions, we got a moderator. Um, uh, um, Bob J. Page in Chapel Hill said, uh, What would Google like to see in the way of notebook PC hardware innovation? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think there's tremendous innovation going on right now in the netbook space. I mean, you're seeing these things become cheaper, more yeah. capable, uh, and we think that's great, uh, particularly if you add connectivity to them. And so we'd like to see that accelerate. We'd love to see the cost come down. Mm -hmm. We were talking a few years ago about the laptop per child. You know, we thought we could get to $100, $200 price point. The reality is that these netbooks, subsidized by carriers, may in fact get to almost free. And uh, I think that has huge implications for children who can get access to these devices. Well, at some point, though, don't they come with a subscription price tag, perhaps? Uh, possibly for yeah. data. Yeah. You know, but, but I predict that you know, you're going to have to pay for data one way or the other. And so attaching that to a computer is probably a great deal. Yeah. Uh, Alan Noren, uh, from, actually from O'Reilly, asked, uh, five years from now, what accomplishments will define success for Google's mobile strategy? So half a decade out, yeah. And Bill, my former boss at uh, Microsoft, used to say that we often overestimate what we can do in three years and underestimate what we can do in ten. So five is five is right in the middle. Um, <laughs> boy, well, I really think what we're going to see is going to surprise people. I mean, in five years, these devices will have do amazing things with the camera. What you'll be able to do with the power of the cloud and the camera, recognize objects, your friends. Uh, you know, what you'll be able to do with voice recognition. I mean, yeah. we'll start to get to the point where these devices will become our agents, our friends. We'll understand our calendars. Uh, we'll understand our intentions. We'll uh, support us with advice. Um, we'll take notes for us. But, you know, I, I see people, you know, kind of showing off the cool new thing on Android, you know, where they're kind of doing, kind of uh, walking with their thing in heads up view. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of silly. Uh, don't you think, in some sense, we may end up with a new form factor? I've been, I've been actually predicting that glasses, uh, you know, there's going to be new kind of high-tech glasses with heads-up display, um, you know, camera, you know. It, it, it could be possible. I do think that the initial attempts in a lot of these areas are considered silly. Yeah. And voice recognition in the early days, it was, uh, it was a nice trick, but yeah. not very usable. And look how far we've come. You know, I, get the, yeah. I get the advantage of looking at daily voice queries coming in, and it's yeah. crazy. It's working. We've yeah. reached a tipping point. 
So do you have, do you have, do you share uh, QPS numbers? We don't share QPS numbers on Google search. It's growing and growing very, very fast, and we're, we're thrilled about it. Uh, but so we, we can really expect some surprises, I, I think. I think so. I think, like I said, this device is not the PC. Yeah. This device has unique attributes, and we're just learning to, to use software uh, to take advantage of the eyes, ears, skin, and, and the knowledge of location. So Mad Mongol um, here in uh, at the show uh, asked whether you guys are going to create a whole suite of offline apps. Absolutely. Everything going offline. Absolutely. Yeah. We are going to be leaders in taking advantage of HTML5. One thing I learned from my days at Microsoft uh, was that you just don't need a great platform. You need tools, and then you must have flagship applications to take advantage of. Yeah. People forget that one of the reasons why Windows was successful was because there was Office. There was a flagship app that showed off the power of Windows. We want to be that company for the web. So uh, what do you make of Stephen Elop's contention that, well, you know, what, what uh, Google Docs and Spreadsheet shows us is that, you know, italics, bold, and underlining is uh, free. Well, he, he has to say that. You notice he forgot about spell checking and a few other features. Uh, you know, I understand that he has to say that, and, and that's great. It turns out for a large number of people, uh, it works very, very well. Okay, another question from uh, Ken Beagle up in Seattle. This is from your Microsoft and Google experience. What makes a successful API, and how do you make uh, encourage APIs to grow in a positive direction? I think there's two different parts of, of making an API successful. Obviously, there's the syntactical nature of it. You do want your APIs, your API family, to have some sort of uh, structure and coherence. Although, even if you fail at that, developers will figure it out. The real question is, is you know. Does your API expose enough functionality that enables developers to do something interesting? Uh, and uh, if you get that right, and your terms of service are, are easy enough for developers to adopt, and you have the right tools, you'll get crazy adoption. I mean, people so you measure it by whether or not it gets adopted. Yeah, I mean, that's the and ultimate. If you go back, if, let's say you put out an API and nobody adopts it, do you scrap it and yeah, do I'll, over? Well, if we clarify that this API is an experiment, it's not what we're committed to, mm -hmm. so we don't want developers betting on something yeah. with their business, and it doesn't get adoption, then yes, failure is part of learning, and that's what happens. So Oliver in Cologne, Germany uh, asks, what social responsibility does Google have, in, for example, in regards to censorship in China? I think when you're a market leader, like Google is, you have a disproportionate amount of social responsibility. It's, it's our job to do right by our customers and, and by the world in general. I think you saw that in Google's philosophy in its early days, its emphasis on not being evil, and I think was a, was a reflection of the understanding that we had a social responsibility. And I think Google continues to try to do the best that it can. We stumble at times, there's so many things to look back on and wish yeah. we could have done different, but I think we're trying the best that we can to take the power of the internet, the, the participatory nature of the internet, the openness of the internet, and drive it everywhere. In some cases, in some cases, the right way to do that is by still being a player in the country because you follow the rules of the country versus saying that you're completely out. And so we limit some of our activities, for example, in China. So, but so, uh, for example, uh, we don't have uh, the ability to log in on Gmail. Mm. Okay. So um, I'm, I know we're, we're actually past time, but I want to squeeze in one last question from Tim Burry in New Jersey. Uh, this is really in the context of the economic downturn. Uh, uh, Tim asks, will Google Ventures make an effort to help small business? I think that's a kind of a tough one. But uh, anyway. help, help small business by helping companies who are building innovative solutions for small business? I think the answer is likely yes, but we're very early uh, in, in that process. And so it's probably a little too early to, to articulate our focus. Does Google have, how, how will Google corporate and Google Ventures work together? Is there, are I, they I, kind of an independent? I, I was talking to Rich the other day and he was saying, hey, you know, this is a real venture firm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the one thing about Google is we often try lots of experiments internally and try different models mm -hmm. and try to see what works. Our end game here is to encourage innovation, to produce better web apps, to produce, uh, uh, let small entrepreneurs who've got great ideas, give them the ability to take those ideas and bring them to scale. And uh, so that's the real goal there. All right. We'll have to cut it there because we're over time. Thanks a lot, Vic.